Hello everyone, today is another Q&A video talking about methylene blue, mold, and vitamin B1 deficiency. Uh, just before jumping into the video, if you don't mind taking a quick moment to please like, share, subscribe, and or post a quick comment on the video, I'd really appreciate it. So thanks in advance for taking a second to do that. And as per usual, nothing I'm saying should be construed as medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. If you need medical advice, please talk to your healthcare provider to get that advice. So uh, the first question here is on was posted on one of my uh, videos which is called don't take this while taking methylene blue I think it's my most most watched video it looks like it has 30,000 views which is a lot for my videos and 311 comments so thanks to folks who have watched this video and just makes me feel good to know that that many people have watched one of my videos it's kind of kind of kind of great um, so anyways uh, one of the uh, questions here was or the question here is uh, what is the risk slash benefit in stopping Parkinson's, carbidopa, and levodopa drug and using methylene blue instead. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, I just wanted to kind of answer this in a more um, general way um, because I thought like, well, reading this at first blush, I mean, again, can't give any advice over social media, um, but if one of my patients came in saying, you know, should I stop my Parkinson's medication and try methylene blue instead, um, I would generally say to that patient, um, no, you probably shouldn't do that um, because they're working through entirely different mechanisms of action. Um, there's no clinical, to my knowledge, no clinical evidence and certainly no research evidence to my knowledge that they're interchangeable in any way, shape or form. Um, so they're you know, completely different medications. Um, that being said, um, many of my patients with different neurological conditions um, or in, in many cases of neurological conditions or disorders, um, methylene blue would certainly be worth something trying, uh, certainly be worth considering. Of course, we have to be careful for other drug interactions and things like that. Um, but kind of just in general, I thought I'd, you know, mention in this video that I'm not aware of methylene blue being a replacement um, supplement or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's it's a dye. It's a chemistry dye. Um, so it's not even a supplement. It's not a naturally occurring compound. It's in the, you know, more functional medicine realm, but uh, it's, it's not like it's a naturally occurring substance. It's not a natural health product. Um, but whatever, whatever you want to call it, it's an incredibly potent antioxidant that at high enough doses, doses, dosages turns into a pro-oxidant, so it's antimicrobial. Um, it's a, it's a, can be a very, very helpful compound, but um, to my knowledge, it doesn't direct or directly replace any, um, you know, existing pharmaceutical drug that might be out there. Now, don't get me wrong, there might be some patients where they're experiencing significant improvements with their cognitive health, or maybe they're experiencing significant improvements with their chronic infections, or um, they're noticing improvements with, um, say, their pain levels, because there's been some research looking at methylene blue being used for pain, and um, I was actually corrected or advised on one of my other videos by someone in the comment section where I was like, I've never heard of methylene blue being used for pain. And I think maybe on Instagram or something, somebody sent me a study showing methylene blue being used for pain. It's like, oh, cool. I, I didn't know that. I've never seen that in practice before, but that's that's great. Um, so it may very well be that someone might start methylene blue and it really helps um, with X, Y, or Z symptoms so they don't need to take a medication anymore. But to my knowledge, methylene blue isn't able to act as a direct replacement for any given medication. And I, I certainly wouldn't advise that for one of my patients with Parkinson's to you know replace their Parkinson's meds with that. Um, you know, with that being said, there's going to be exceptions to every rule. And if there was a patient who say was not tolerating their Parkinson's meds well, and um, they seem to feel better off their meds, and methylene blue made them feel you know even better, it's like well that might be a nuanced case where they would from the naked eye would be like, oh, you replaced your Parkinson's meds with methylene blue, but that would again be a very, very nuanced case, but it's not kind of a direct replacement. So anyways, thank you for the question. And uh, thanks again for everyone who's commented on that that uh, video. Uh, the next topic is about mold. I'm just switching my windows here. Um, so uh, a much, a much less viewed video. I mean, granted, it was only put out two weeks ago. A hundred views with eight comments. So you know, that's 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 more my speed. Um, but anyways, the question was, um, uh, uh, let's see here. Two it says here two questions regarding mold symptoms flaring up. Uh, one, can summer weather slash high humidity be factors? Um, in my experience, uh, yes, I have seen summer weather slash high humidity um, flare up mold symptoms in quite a few patients over the years. So I've seen that many a time. Um, and then number two, uh, recently started using a low EMF sauna blanket. I'm pleasantly warm, but not sweating. Um, even at the highest temperature of 176 degrees Fahrenheit, could toxins be released and then recirculating given that I'm not releasing them 
going through sweat? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I am, I'm not 100% sure. Um, that would be a logical conclusion because if it's not an EMF issue because it's a low EMF sauna blanket and that seems to be what's you know causing a flare-up to happen like it, it seems that the sauna blanket is the trigger then yeah I, my strong suspicion would be that it's because the toxins are being mobilized excessively um, whether that's because the um, toxins are you know not getting out through, like they're being mobilized but not for so this the blanket is stimulating the toxin release from the tissues but then not um, creating enough of a warming reaction of the body to stimulate sweating so the toxins are getting stuck and that's what's causing the problem. I'm not sure. It, it's, a, it's possible that even if you, the, you know, a person was in the scenario and they did start sweating, that they would still feel crummy even with the sweat, you know, maybe because the degree to which talk, the degree to which we're able to release toxins through sweat, um, I haven't seen any compelling evidence to strongly suggest that we're able to release massive amounts of toxins through sweat. I'm a big fan of sauna therapy. I think sweating is great, very health promoting, but um, to what extent we're actually excreting toxins into the world, um, I like, you know, out of our bodies, you know, um, sort of magically uh, or very conveniently bypassing the need to like go through all the liver detox pathways and all that. I'm honestly not really sure to what extent that happens. I haven't seen any research literature um, definitively telling us the answers to that. There have been some studies that have you know, looked at the effects of sauna therapy and not really shown much excretion at all in the sweat, um, like when measuring, say, like heavy metal levels or things like that in sweat. Um, but I'm not a consummate expert on the, on the topic, and there may very well be some published literature out there that does indeed show like how many different chemicals and metals and things like that that we are excreting. So if anybody watching the video happens to know that information or has that info, I'd be you know, certainly curious to take a look at it. So um, anyways, starting to get into the weeds here of um, thinking this through, but um, it, I would say that it's entirely possible that um, the sauna blanket could be um, causing a release of toxins that are just not being dealt with properly, but whether the lack of sweating is the culprit or it's um, something else going on, like with the internal systems not being able to process the toxins quickly and efficiently enough, like. I think that there's some room for debate there around that, but um, that, that would be a reasonable theory, um, I, I certainly think. Uh, so thank you for those questions. And then the last one here, I hope I can do this in, in the next couple of minutes that I have on this video. So um, it says, do you have any cases involving thiamine deficiency? How did they present and resolve? Um, did you see the paradoxical reaction? How common are chronic vitamin deficiencies in clinical practice these days? How would you test for vitamin B1? So uh, thank you for all those questions. I probably should have done a whole video on this, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot um, here. So um, one of the products that I recommend to my patients all the time is mitochondrial support formula. I've talked about this in many videos in the past. Um, so please feel free to search my YouTube channel and um, search ter keyword search mitochondrial support uh, in my name and um, the, the video should come up on that. Um, one of the key ingredients in there is benfetiamine, which is the fat soluble form of vitamin B1. Um, and it's at a fairly robust dose. Um, it works out to, to be like 300 milligrams a day for the full therapeutic dose of that, which is quite robust. So um, I'm putting patients on uh, a, a high potency thiamine protocol all the time in through, through giving that supplement. That um, supplement has helped many, many patients with many conditions and I, I do wonder how many of those cases um, is it actually related to thiamine deficiency being corrected. So I don't know because to my knowledge, while you can get blood levels tested for thiamine, I'm not sure exactly how accurate that test is. And so it's just a bit uh, debatable as to how, how accurate that test is or how useful that test is at picking up the deficiency. Um, in terms of symptoms that I've seen uh, with um, you know, known thiamine deficiency, I, I don't know because uh, it's really hard to test for, but I think that fatigue, maybe brain fog would be two of the biggest ones. There is a doctor named Chandler Mars. She's a medical doctor. She co-authored a book all about vitamin B1 deficiency. She had, there was a great interview with her on the Better Health Guy podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts of all time. And they get all into the weeds of vitamin B1 deficiency. So I'd recommend checking that out to get into the, all of the sort of like less uh, lesser known symptoms that can be associated with B1 deficiency. But I think 
it probably is a really important thing to address. And I think that I'm just kind of getting lucky by addressing it by, by default because I put so many of my patients on mitochondrial support formula. Um, so I hope that answered your questions. If you have further questions on the B1, just post in the comment section. And I'll happily do another video with more specific info if you have more specific questions beyond that. Um, otherwise, I will leave it there for now. If anybody has any questions or comments on these topics or anything else, just post in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer as soon as I can.